recording, so I will say that as well. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hide, uh, hide your cell view, please. Recording, so I will say that as well. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to all of those in attendance. I can see there are people coming into the meeting room. Thank you for being here. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. My name is John Paul Rodriguez. I chair the UCN Species Survival Commission. I'm here in Caracas, in Venezuela, and I can see that there are about 100 people already um, in the room, so wonderful to have you here. This uh, seminar, or this webinar, sorry, is the second one uh, that we've had about the Global Species Action Plan. It's a, uh, which for, from IUCN guides efforts to halt biodiversity loss. You'll hear a lot about this during the next uh, next little while, an hour or so. So I'm delighted to introduce to you uh, Dan Guyen, who's a IUCN Senior Program Manager for the Species Conservation Action Plan. She'll be followed by David Mallon, who's a Special Advisor to the IUCN Species Survival Commission. He's a co-chair of the Antelope Specialist Group. Il Young Oh, who's from the Republic of, of uh, Korea, uh, Senior Governor Manager, and thank you for all the support of your government to the um, to the Global Species Action Plan and to IUCN in general. It's wonderful to have you with us, Il Young. And Domitila Raimondo will close. Um, she uh, currently serves as Threatened Species Program Manager of the South African National Biodiversity Institute. We know it as SAMBI, usually and she's a co-chair of this Plant Conservation Committee of the UCN Species of Our Commission. So it's great to have you all here. Dao, the floor over to you to initiate the conversation. And uh, thanks again to all of those in attendance up to one, 125 now, wonderful. Thank you so much. Dao. Uh, Just one quick, quick last thing that I forgot to say, Dao, you're muted, but one quick last thing. This meeting is being recorded and the live stream will be made available later on. If you do not wish to be recorded, please, you, you should leave the meeting and, and watch the recording later. Uh, if you remain, it's because you're in agreement with being recorded. Thanks again, Dao, over to you. Thank you so much, John Paul. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Dao Nguyen, the Senior Program Manager for Conservation Action. Uh, in the Species Conservation Action Team at the IUCN Secretariat. So I'm very pleased to um, be with you here today to talk about the Global Species Action Plan. Um, so I want to just show with you very <clears throat> briefly on the reason why we came up with this uh, Global Species Action Plan to support the implementation of the Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, so IUCN SSC leaders meeting uh, in Abu Dhabi in 2019 uh, gather at the, the right time at the end of the decade of the IG target. So I hope you all um, know about the IG 20 IG targets in the previous decade from 2011 to 2020. Um, and at that time, the assessment of the IG target uh, that most of the uh, target didn't meet the, the target. Um, so especially for IG target 12, which was about in prevent extinction and improve um, the status of threatened species. So the target was not met and actually was off track and totally very few um, progress. So the leaders uh, had a call, a global call for species conservation action. And, and it was an, a declaration to call for uh, urgent conserva action, conservation action to bring about the sustained recovery of wild species, especially threatened species, to prevent extinction, reduce extinction risk, maintain abundance of um, non-threatened species, and of course, um, bring about the sustained recovery of wild uh, threatened species and ensure that their use is safe, uh, legal, and sustainable. And uh, from that call, from the leaders of SSC, 
um, we want to pledge more technical support needed to achieve species conservation um, and for the, the uh, globally. And it is critical to have a, a program of work um, to mobilize these conservation action. And so after that um, meeting of the leaders in Abu Dhabi in 2019 and in early 2020, uh, a team was set up led by the IUCN Secretariat by Dr. Jane Smart here. I think a lot of you knew her and she now retired, but um, she was leading this with Dr. David Mallon, who will be speaking after me, uh, to gather a team from IUCN uh, Secretariat from the Commission, SSC, uh, and members of IUCN and uh, partners to develop this uh, Global Species Action Plan to support, um, um, to provide the how to implement the global biodiversity framework. Um, so during the uh, working process, we had uh, the COVID, and that's why you saw here all the photos are in the COVID period where all of us met online. And um, but it was also lucky in a way that most of people have more time to contribute to the development of the 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 GSAP, I call it for short, the Global Species Action Plan. And um, the team met a lot of time to uh, discuss and came up with the Global Species Action Plan that David will present later. But um, we had a lot of consultations with um, the, all the biodiversity related conventions to guide the process. And of course, many rounds of consultation with the SSC and uh, the IUCN and partners and all the global um, biodiversity related conventions. So these are um, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, the two plants treaties, the Ramsar Convention, CITES, CMS. Uh, so we work with them closely to guide us on the, in, on the development of the uh, GSAC. And uh, we were also very lucky to have the support from uh, our commissions, uh, especially the Ministry of Environment of um, Republic of Korea, and also the partnership with the um, French government and IUCN, and then all the other um, biodiversity related con um, conventions, as well as partners. And, um, and these are the partners. And we also um, have Sandy, especially uh, South African National Biodiversity Institute, joining uh, us as well to support. So we are calling for more support from other organizations. Um, so I just briefly uh, mentioned an overview of the process of development of the Global Species Action Plan to support the implementation of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework adopted at the end of 2022, that now every country's um, CBD parties are now implementing. And now I will, uh, yeah, so I will stop here because the day before uh, talk further. Thank you very much, John Paul. It looks like we lose John Paul. So I won't pass directly to David Mallon to to now present us on the next plan um, content and structure. Okay. Can you share the screen, please, Dale? Yes, I'm working on it now. John Paul, did we lose you for a bit? We can't, we can't. Sorry, hear. I was muted, excuse me. Over to you, David. I, I think uh, you'll be watching uh, Dale's screen. Yes. There we go. Okay, well, thanks very much, John Paul and Dow. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you are. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. As Dow said, I was um, involved in the development of the GSAP from the beginning as a sort of coordinating comments and um, drafting the text. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, Dow, please. So, 
the actual content and structure of the GSAP is is, is clearly you know an, an, the most important aspect of it. The first thing to note is that from the beginning, the GSAP was completely aligned with the Global Biodiversity Framework. It was never intended to be any kind of alternative or separate product. It's a support mechanism to implement the species related actions of the GBF, the Global Biodiversity Framework. So there are a few pages of introductory text highlighting why species conservation is so important, both in general and to the achievement of the Global Biodiversity Framework. But most importantly, it, the uh, GSAP identifies all the actions required to achieve the species outcomes for each of the 23 GBF targets. It also highlights the tools and resources that are available to implement these identified actions. So together, as I said earlier, it provides a support mechanism for species related actions. And one of the most important aspects from the point of view of governments is it doesn't require any additional reporting. So again, it's not a separate product with a separate reporting line. It's simply a mechanism to help people implement species related actions. So we know that conservation action mainly takes place at national level, primarily through national biodiversity strategies and action plans, but it's also supported by action at global and regional levels. So we're going to make sure that the linkages between these all these actors are, are kind of fully aligned because they are crucial to achieving species conservation outcomes for the GBF. Uh, next slide, please. So the main, the main body of the GSAP is a large table um, which covers each of the 23 targets. And it, each, each uh, section begins with the target itself. You can see here target three on important sites with the, the target listed at the top. And then below is a GSAP rationale what particular aspects of this target are important for species and, and the components that are contained therein. Then we follow with three columns. First of all, the objectives, they're in light blue, 3.1, identifying sites important for conservation, followed by actions within each of those. And then there's a list of actors. The list of actors is um, not complete. It's got all the main actors in there. And we're hoping and expecting that many people, partners, stakeholders from across the world will join in later. On the right hand column, tools and resources is a list of the tools, resources that are available to support implementation of the action. And we'll come on to how those work a bit later. Next slide, please. <laughs> Target four is concerned with species conservation, preventing extinctions, improving the status of threatened species, and preventing um, the deterioration of other species. So target four is probably the most important uh, target for all of the um, for, for all of the GBF as far as species are concerned. You can see many of the resources listed on the right hand side there, the IUCN Red List, the IUCN Green Status of Species, Living Planet Index, are all tools and resources that we are mainly familiar with. Next slide, please. So we continue down. There are, there are a, a, um, a very large number of targets, uh, sorry, of um, actions supporting all of these targets. Some of them have many tools and resources. Some of them have only a few. Next slide, please. Target six is concerned with uh, invasive species, for example, which is a hugely important topic and one where IUCN is, has a leading role through its invasive species uh, specialist group and all their tools and resources. Next one, please. It is, however, really important to remember, and we were um, we discussed this at length with the CBD Secretariat, 
the 23 targets are all closely interlinked. And the CBD were very keen that the that nobody, um, as it were, cherry picked the targets and just took one or two to work on and focused on the on the way that they were all interlinked. So this diagram here, which is at the comes at the end of the GSAP, just shows some of the interconnections between the targets and key species outcomes. It's very difficult to put all the uh, connections in there because there are so many. But the arrows um, do highlight the main uh, the, the main connections, as it were. So we're looking from the point of view at the GSAP at the central green circle there. So what is the aim of the GSAP? Well, it's focused on target four, preventing extinctions of species, reducing the extinction risk and maintaining an increasing abundance of other species. And all the green boxes on the right hand side show the different components of that particular uh, target all contributing towards species recovery and the achievement of target four. There are a number of support and uh, other mechanisms, funding, knowledge, uh, involvement of women, youth, and indigenous peoples and local communities um, along the bottom there. And these basically connect to all of the individual targets. Next slide, please. So it's very much hoped that the GSAP will aid governments and their and their partners to update their national biodiversity strategy and action plans in, by incorporating all the actions needed for species. So it, it's fully intended to be used as as this um, as this guide, as it were, um, and it's already been listed. The GSAP's already been listed under the relevant resources by the CBD that can assist implementation. And in, in particular, the CBD's identified targets four, five, and six, uh, where the GSAP they feel has a particular impact. Next one, please. So the tools and resources that we just mentioned in the table are really a long list. And it's fairly easy to compile a list, but that just tell that just tells us what, what is available and what needs to be done. So this next stage of the GSAP is the is an online knowledge platform called Skills, Species Conservation Knowledge, Information Learning, Leverage and Sharing. And the idea of the Skills platform is it's a one-stop shop for the tools, resources and solutions for species conservation. So the main principle behind it is to add the how to the what. We have had many uh, comments since the IG targets that Dow mentioned originally, that governments and stakeholders have said to, pe said to people in IUCN and others, OK, you tell us what to do, but we don't know how to do it. So the idea here is that this is this is the how to. So firstly, the skills platform will provide a user guide to all the tools and resources and solutions that are needed by everybody who is working at national level. It will inform the development and updating of national biodiversity strategy and action plans, as just mentioned earlier, and in some cases, national species strategies, which is a, a tool that's being developed by a few countries to focus heavily on the on their priority species. So each resource page on the skills platform will contain a description, plus how to use it, plus where to find further information or guidance. It's written in simple language to aid clarity and to aid translation into other languages. And finally, it's there to promote collaboration and partnership to scale up species conservation globally. The skills platform is being led by Dow, and it's be, it currently uh, under development. And hopefully the first version will be, released, will be released quite soon. And it's intended, as I said, to be a, a practical user guide for everybody, governments and their and their partners and other stakeholders to actually implement the actions needed for species conservation. Next slide. Okay, that, that and that's thank you very much from me. Thank you, David. It's really excellent to hear all the progress and all the work going on. So next we'll hear a specific case of how um how the the GSAP has been used to support 
the identification of actions and the MPs app of, of Korea. And Mr. Young Oh will, will, will uh, tell us about that. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, now my name, hi, hello, I'm uh, Ilya Mo from Korea Ministry of Environment. So currently I'm second year to ICN headquarters. Uh, I'll be presenting on MBSAP update in Korea and global species action plans benefit in Korean case. And I'm very pleased to have this meaningful opportunity to speak about this initiative. Uh, here is the flow of the content I will present. It. The first is background, and the second is species related aspects in Korea's MBSA. And the last is the how to use GSAP approach in MBSA update in uh, national level at national level. So, here, uh, in the context of species-related actions for GBF targets, uh, there are two key initiatives in Korea. The first one is the first initiative is to develop species-related action plans in Korea's MBSA. The Korean MBSA was approved in the December of last year uh, by Korean cabinet, and the multi, multi ministries participated in the process. The second initiative involves a joint project with IUCN to promote the GCM initiative. Uh, this project consists of two streams. Uh, already, uh, David, uh, David Marlon explained the details. Anyway, stream one is to promote the GCM initiative and guideline. The stream two is to establish a new online platform to accelerate species related actions in various stakeholders. So here, uh, Dao and uh, Marlon already explained this uh, guideline. So the Korean uh, Irish and Joint Project is conducting Stream 1 and Stream 2 now. This publication is the important guidebook of Stream 1. This was released at CBD Substar meeting in October last year. Uh, from now, I'll uh, present a specific actions that South Korea developed in its uh, MB sub update. Uh, the major targets related to species uh, are target four and five and six. The previous speakers already uh, highlighted the importance of target four, five, six. Uh, Korea's MB sub uh, encompasses conserving endangered species and genetic diversity and sustainable management of human-wildlife interaction in Target 4. Actions for Target 5 uh, covers the sustainable use of wild species, the management of sites listed species, and preventing the spread of diseases caused by wildlife. Next, regarding Target 4, uh, Target 6, Target 6 uh, include uh, invasive alien species. It involves measures to prevent the introduction of uh, alien species and the removal of already introduced alien species. Uh, beyond the three objectives uh, previously outlined, uh, incorporating actions related to species is vital for uh, numerous other goals. Uh, for example, sp spatial planning for nature in target one, uh, restoring damaged ecosystems as per target two, the sustainability of fisheries and aquaculture in line with Target 10. By integrating species-related actions into these targets, a comprehensive e efforts can be made to promote biodiversity conservation and achieve the broader goals of the environmental conventions. Uh, now, I'd like to explain how g -sharp approach can be utilized in the development of MBSAP uh, in Korea. Uh, well, this diagram uh, already explained uh, by previous speakers. Uh, anyway, this diagram is uh, quoted from the g -sharp guideline uh, and illustrates how the 23 targets of GBF are interconnected with the species. 
Uh, as outlined in the South Korea said Visa, uh, there are numerous targets that are directly or indirectly related to species conservation. Building and Visa with this under, uh, understanding significantly reduce the possibility of missing necessary actions for species conservation. Oh, this table uh, it was already explained by previous speakers. Uh, from Korea's side, uh, I can say that uh, this uh, G-Sharp guidebooks uh, explain that these tables and captures are related to a target for. Uh, for instance, to achieve the objectives related to species extinction, uh, it involves a four-step process. Additionally, it's evident that target four requires actions in three specific areas. Uh, furthermore, it is that include specific uh, sub practices with reference to guidelines from relevant international organizations. Uh, personally, uh, personally uh, I believe uh, there are five key aspects in which g -Sharp can be valuable. First, uh, it allows us to identify the species-related actions required for each target. I mean, not only for Target four, five, six. I uh, I'd like to say that all twenty three targets has a, a related elements of our species conservation. Second, during the MBSA development process, it, it facilitates the assessment of what the government has done in the past and present, and what needs to be done in the future. Third, it provides guidelines for implementing species related actions. However. Each country may need to adapt these guidelines according to each specific circumstance. Fourth, uh, GSHAP allows for the inclusion of requirements from other international environment agreements related to species conservation into the MBSA uh, beyond CBD agreement. Uh, Dao already explained how many international uh, Agreements uh, take part in to build up this uh, design design process of GSHA. Anyway, uh, seven environment agreements participated. Anyway, uh, when uh, government level or uh, national level uh, establishment of the MBS have to include all the other kind of environment agreements to re uh, requirement. The fifth, it is helpful in enhancing. The understanding of various stakeholders related to uh, species conservation. Uh, I am truly honored to present the case of South Korea at the SSC webinar here. I hope this case contributes to global species conservation effort. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Il Young. Really fantastic work in, in, uh, in South Korea. Um, it's really great. We're doing great, perfectly with time. We have the last presentation, Domitila Raimondo, who will talk to us about the experience in South Africa. You may, you may all know. I'm sure that Sandy in South Africa is one of the world leaders in the use of these tools and and spatial planning and red listing and lots of different things that have to do with the UCN world. And Domitila has been involved with this for a long time. So we are perfectly on time. Domitila, over to you, and then we'll open the floor for uh, about 20 minutes for questions and, and exchange. I see a couple of questions in the chat and the Q&A. Please uh, uh, feel free to add your thoughts there as well. Domitila, over to you. Thank you, John Paul. Morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Um, so I'm going to present a little bit of the work we've been doing that links to the Global Species Action Plan in South Africa. Um, I am part of the National Institute for Biodiversity um, and we're an entity of the Department of Environment Affairs. Okay, so fortunately for us, we've also been quite involved in one of the partners that developed the GSAP. Um, <clears throat> just to start off with, I'm gonna take you through specific examples in the GSAP, just to show you how we've used it. But I think quite critical to say for any group trying to, to implement the, the actions we've put in the GSAP, it's really critical to bring the species experts together and organize them. And in South Africa, we really have done this very, like, for a while now. We've brought together species experts for each taxonomic group, and then we organize them at the national level. 
And we've recently formalized this into um, um, uh, an IUCN National Species Specialist Group. If you're not aware, the IUCN SSC has a new uh, option for countries to form species specialist groups. And it's really worth doing because you can bring all your experts together. So um, based on um, based on this option, we, we have organized all our species experts. And then we've also conducted the, um, you know, actually done the assessments to understand what's going on for each, each, all the species. So before you can do any of the actions in the GSAP, you have to know what's actually going on with all your species. So conducting red list assessments at the national level is very critical for multiple taxonomic groups. Um, and um, if the if your country has little capacity, you can you can take what's on the IUCN red list, the global red list. But it is really important to try to do comprehensive assessments for multiple groups. And we do have the action there under target four, the GSAP. You'll see in turquoise blue in my presentation are, are the actual GSAP actions. Um, also, what's critical during the red list process is that we produce really accurate data for each species. So the, this just shows you one example. Um, there's always information on exactly what's threatened each species shown on the right hand side and those are the for each of those threats it tells you what actions and recovery actions could could take place and how to actually tackle those threats and then we also produce spatial data as so you see on the top um, right hand side there the little orange dots are where this particular frog occurs and that spatial data is really really important um, to know where you need to act to conserve species. So I'm going to focus on two targets. I'm going to focus on target one and target four during my talk. Um, and target one is not one that has been highlighted by the CBD Secretariat as important for species, but I'd like to argue differently. I think it's one of the most important targets. And it's it, and it's new in, and, uh, in, in the global biodiversity framework. We didn't have a spatial biodiversity planning target under, under the IHE framework. Um, and so what target one is about is actually planning for the important areas for for biodiversity and to ensure you don't you don't lose those habitats. So it's spatial biodiversity planning. Um, and I just showed you here an example of a map for South Africa, but I will give you a bit more detail of what it is. So what this what you see in the map, you see dark green areas are protected areas, existing protected areas, and then the bright green and other color green areas are priority areas where we want to retain biodiversity. And that's what you mean by a spatial biodiversity plan is an actual spatial place of where you want to retain your biodiversity. <clears throat> okay, so why is this important for species? It's really, really important because it, it protects both the, 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 the common species and the restricted species. And I'll show you how we do that. And we've put in all the actions in the GSAP of exactly how to do this. So I'm going to take you through the actions. So you can see also, so you can each see like an example of what the GSAP has to offer you. Okay, so um, under the first thing we say under, 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 under target one for the GSAP is we say you actually have to set a target um, in your spatial plan for at least 30% of each ecosystem type. That links also to, to, to the, the 30 by 30 target, uh, target three. But if you conserve 30% of each ecosystem type, so terrestrial and marine and freshwater, all the different types, you will conserve all your common and wide, widespread species. And that's very, very important. And then the next thing is to say for special species, for your threatened species, your restricted range species and your socioeconomically important species. You also need to set targets. And in South Africa, we've managed to set targets for 5,232 species. Um, we have a lot of threatened species, a lot of restricted range species because we're a mega diverse country. So it can be quite a lot of work to generate that data, but through the red list assessment process, by producing that spatial data, you should have it available. Then you set targets to, to, to conserve those. And that with the ecosystem targets allows you to identify the important places for these species. You also need to make sure then linking to target three, but we've got it also under target one under the GSAP, is that where there are places where species and ecosystems are not yet properly protected, that you plan protected area expansion for those places. So this is a map of just one of our, our states in South Africa, our provinces, the Western Cape, um, and the dark blue areas are now the protected areas and the bright green areas show where we need to expand protected areas, the priority areas 
um, with the bright blue showing where we're currently negotiating those new protected areas. Um, we've got quite a, a detailed cycle around this work. So we you'll see on the bottom left corner, we actually assess protection level for every species and check how well protected they are. If they're dark green, they're well protected. If they're um, gray, they're not. And that shows for all each bars for each taxonomic group. So if you if you look at that bottom, those bottom graphs, you see reptiles are relatively well protected, where freshwater fish are very poorly protected. Okay, then for species that are not yet protected, the gray species or the light green species, we actually produce the maps you see in the top right corner of exactly where all those species occur, and we feed that into the protected area expansion work. Um, and we've been fortunate that our government's actually asked us to set a target because we've raised the problem of species being poorly protected to increase species protection level by 5%. So it's a parliamentary target. Um, it's also linked to our current NBSAP that we have to improve species protection level. And so this is a great cycle and we'll keep on measuring and we keep on improving it. Um, then also under target one is that you not, don't not only need to protect, but you also need to avoid habitat loss. And through these spatial plans, by identifying the important places, you can do all the mainstreaming work with all the development sectors through spatial development frameworks, EIAs, and, and agricultural authorizations, mining authorizations, et cetera, um, to, to, to ensure you don't lose those places. And so we've got that specifically in the GSAP and with some good examples of how to do that, because we know that many countries haven't yet tried this. But once you've got a spatial plan, it's easy to, to link it to these authorizations. Um, and then most importantly is to kind of in, ensure that legislation for habitat loss linked to environmental authorizations for EIAs um, it really have good species data feeding into it. And so in South Africa, we've actually produced, we've ensured that each, like from the red list assessments, you saw the spatial plan, for each of the species that are threatened, their, their spatial data is on a tool. So if anybody wants to develop, when they put their footprint, it intersects with that. And we've also developed these species environmental assessment guidelines that tell in the EIA process exactly what recommendations should be made for the species. So this is what we really promote in, in the GSAP. We give you this kind of detail and explanations with examples. <clears throat> Okay, and then I also mentioned that I would talk about target four. Um, David did highlight that it's a it's the crit a critical one for species. It is so even if you do all the other targets in the G uh, in the global biodiversity framework, there are some species that have got have declined to the point that even if you protect uh, do you achieve the thirty percent protected area target, even if you restore habitats, even if you stop invasive aliens, et cetera, et cetera, you, they will still decline to extinction. And those are the species that need urgent recovery action. And that's what we have to do under target four. And that involves breeding, uh, ex situ or in situ, uh, ex -situ activities, and then reintroductions um, and making sure that the populations do actually recover. So um, what is really important now is that every country actually has to work out which species are in need of urgent recovery actions. And many haven't done that. There might be a few well-known threatened species that have got conservation plans and, and recovery action happening for them, but have they checked that every species, so every little invertebrate that might be going extinct or plant, or all the species that need these actions are happening. And so um, in South Africa, we have recently over the last year been doing an exercise to identify which species need the recovery action. And um, it's quite a high number, 262 priority ones that need urgent urgent recovery action. Um, and then you have to cost. You have to plan for those species. How do they need to recover? You need to cost it. You need to make sure that their stakeholders are working on them. And so this is the big change. It wasn't in the framework before. We we're expecting all countries to do that. So uh, target one is also wasn't in the framework before. So if you do all your proper spatial planning, you'll catch all your species if you conserve the habitat. And then those ones that are not going to be saved like that, that are really too low, have to have this urgent recovery action. So those are the two targets I wanted to highlight. Um, and then just to conclude, um, we found that the GSAP is a really useful framework to ensure the species, uh, to, for ensuring species conservation and to achieve the GBF. It's just very detailed. Each action is clear. 
Um, and we're currently using it to motivate which species actions must be included in the in the update of the NBSAP. We haven't got to the um, point of updating the NBSAP, but we're looking at all the gaps and we, we're quantifying the costs needed. So that's really, really valuable. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I really promote using it. And I do want to say that it might feel a little bit overwhelming, the, G, the GSAP. There are a lot of activities, there are a lot of activities, um, and there's a lot of tools that are there. Um, if, if you're in a country where the resources are very low, there, there are options to do like a bare minimum. And, and just as a call out to that, I want to say that the, the bare minimum, if you don't want to go through the detailed species planning that I showed now, the spatial planning, is to do key biodiversity area identification. And the IUCN has, has a standard on that. Hopefully everyone is aware of it. If you identify key biodiversity areas, you can do all the things that I just showed you, like check your protected areas are there, um, and do the other actions like clear invasive aliens there, do all of the um, um, the, the threat-based reduction activities there and the protected area expansions activity there and you get very far. It's not perfect. The way I showed earlier with target one and going through all the targets like we've got in the GSAP is the best space. But just in, if it feels overwhelming and if countries don't have a lot of resources, they should at least identify KBAs do the work to protect those KBAs, reduce threats in them, and then they still have to do the target for the urgent recovery actions. So we just thought I would highlight there is an option uh, for resource poor countries to think about. And we've seen it very successfully done in some African countries recently. Okay, thanks so much. I'm interested to hear the, the, the comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Domitila. And thanks to all for... Uh... Your succinct and straight to the point um, messages. We have a couple of questions on the chat. There's a series of comments uh, from Karin Mazali interested in uh, uh, discussing about the, the impact of illegal, illegal fishing and trade marine species. How can you do to raise awareness? Where do, can we get funds? Um, really, lots of questions about marine biodiversity. I don't know if anyone uh, would like to take that. I'll just see which other questions we have here. Regina Firi, um, Zimbabwe. Just uh, basically, it's a thank you. And James Pierce Higgins asking about climate change. So maybe, Domitila, would you like to take the climate change question? I know you, you have been working a lot on that. Um, adaptation of species and habitats to climate change. And, um, and then we'll maybe open the floor for a little bit of a conversation on marine species, and then uh, we'll see what else there is. So Domitila, over to you on climate change. Yeah, thanks. I didn't put that in my talk because it's just too much. Um, in, in the spatial planning work, you can absolutely plan for climate change. So you can you can look at where species will be moving to and set targets to, to conserve that. And um, I, I didn't focus in, but in our spatial plan in South Africa, we've identified special corridors and upland and lowland migration areas. That's what you don't get from key biodiversity areas. But if you do a proper spatial plan, you can totally plan for processes and where species will move for climate change. So that's why I feel that target one is really, really important. Um, and then, yeah, and if you if you look at target eight also, we need to be doing those adaptation uh, activities. But, but we, we're managing... To, to plan for, for climate change. We're also including climate change in, 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 in threat assessments so that you could see which species are most likely to be impacted and then respond for those. Some of them are already being impacted and we have shifted into that target four mode of urgent recovery actions to ensure they don't go extinct. So I'm sure other countries will also be in that space. So, so there's you know climate change effects across the targets, but if you do the spatial planning well, you can you can minimize the impact for species. And I think that's what's really important about target one. Where it's too late, do target four and do the urgent recovery on them. Yeah, and at UCN, we always speak about climate change and biodiversity as being two sides of the same coin, the two expressions of the general biodiversity crisis. And that, uh, you know, maybe the red list doesn't yet capture the impact of climate change or species, but it's sure going to be there very soon. Uh, in terms of marine, maybe I'll take a little bit of that since I have the marine background. Um, 
uh, you know, 99, our, our, uh, the chair of the Marine Conservation Committee of SSC, Amanda Vincent, always says, you know, the earth is not, the, the biosphere, the living portion of the earth, 99% of the biosphere is underwater. So it'll be much, much more appropriate for earth to be called water than to be called earth. And um, and um, there are lots of interests and lots of uh, we don't have kind of the expertise on this panel to go deep into marine conservation issues, but it's certainly a topic that we're thinking about a lot. They're very interested, and uh, we we see uh, much growth, especially from within the SSC and experts organizing around around uh, marine issues. Also, if you look at the, the our uh, species strategic plan, we have a, a spatial visualization tool that shows in the, in the major oceans of the world, the activities that we do from, from SSC there. So I'd invite you to look at that and then, you know, um, reach out to any of the specialist group chairs that may have, uh, may focus on the, on the group of organisms that you're interested in or the region. And um, I'm sure you'll find lots of opportunities there. Uh, any other questions? Oh, I see in the q and I'm going back there. Uh, Kristen Lewis for Domitila, when you identified those species that need urgent recovery action, did you by any chance use the methodology in the paper by Bolam at all, or do you use another existing methodology or develop your own? Over to you, Domitila. Um, so, so I'm one of the authors on the Bolam et al. paper, so yes, we did use that methodology, but we did add a little bit to it. Um, and by combining all the criteria from the IUCN. So we, we use that, that criteria calls for you to look for criteria in C and D, it says species under endangered and critically endangered. But we also feel that if you look at the criteria in A, where it tracks how quickly a population is, 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 is declining, it gives you even better prioritization of things that need urgent urgent attention. So we just did a little bit of extra, but yeah, the, the Bolam and L methodology is perfectly fine for, for, for the majority of cases. It's use that as the basis and then add to it. Thank you. By the way, if anybody would like to speak live, you may raise your hand and, and uh, Naomi can give you the floor. But I have another question uh, from Rebecca Tharm. What support, if any, does the UCN envisage providing to national government users of the skills platform to help build their own national internal capacity to undertake the actions needed under the Global Species Action Plan? Um, before I give the floor to Dao, who will surely be able to respond, I just want to bring your attention the World Species Congress that is happening on 15 May. is part of, uh, IUCN is very involved in this, uh, as part of the Reverse the Red movement. Um, th there, th a lot of the global species, the World Species Congress focuses specifically on, on developing support and interactions at the national level, like, like David said earlier, you know, although we think globally in terms of our plans and priorities, a lot of the actions happen nationally, and uh, we're very keen to strengthen that through Reverse the Red, through the World Species Congress, and through skills that now that I will tell you about now. Yeah, thank you, John. Well, that's exactly what the purpose is, to provide this um, tool so that at the national level, um, by the support of the SSC network, like Tila just mentioned about how South Africa uh, is organizing um, all the different species experts in the national species uh, specialist group and with other specialist group. And John Paul just mentioned about reverse the red and other a mechanism at the national level that support national government to implement. And so the idea for the GSAP skills platform is to provide so we are um, harvesting all the tools and resources within IUCN uh, as an union from all our members, our commissions, and our IUCN uh, system, but also from all the other um, biodiversity-related conventions and other partners that have. So we will, um, and as a GSAP table that David show, it, um, it has all these, and we constantly updating as well to get more and more uh, resources and tools to the platform we also then the the other way of the traffic is to then push it out for um being used at the national level and we hope to use this interactively uh, and proactively um to support countries so if you um it can share and promote um uh, because it's not launched yet so we can't share with you the 
the website yet, but uh, we hope to launch it in in May. And uh, thanks a lot to the support, for, uh, funding support from Ministry of Environment of the Republic of Korea um, has been really crucial for this platform. And um, we will hope to be able to train people to use it as well and interactively support people to, to use it. And of course, through the mechanism, like um, John Paul said, Rivers are Red, SSE Network. And of course, today we have all of you are SSE members. We hope to then also push through the channel of the SSC uh, members, more than 10,000 members. So we hope to, to build up this, this support system. Thank you, John Paul. Thank you, Dal. There's a question from, from Jesus Sigala who asks us, uh, what kind of work do we do to uh, con counter the lack of interest on species protection by governments? I don't know uh, who would like to take that. John Paul, oh, <laughs> or uh, I, I take it. Uh, great, great. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so it's so a difficult question. How great the increased interest of the government for species conservation? Oh, uh, I'd like to say that the Korean case. Uh, in Korean case, uh, we have uh, lost, lost a lot of uh, species in during the industrialization of the Korean War. At that time, Korean government selected some flagship species for Korea country. For example, the tiger or some kind of uh, endemic bear and also endemic plants and so on. So those kind of flagship species and uh, conservation initiative for flagship con uh, species, it, it, it in increased the uh, in interest and the, from the public or from the from the government. Also, I this is this is a, can be the one way to anyway raise the awareness of importance of the species conservation. Also, increase of the government. Uh, the government. Also, second one is that uh, nowadays uh, global organizations and many countries talking about nature based solution. So, uh, as one of the objective of nature based solution is to increase. Uh, can say restore the damaged uh, habitats in, uh, or restore, regenerate, uh, or deteriorated uh, ecosystems. So anyway, in those kind of approach, the basic one element to be considered is the species issues. Anyway, the species is the, can be a heart of the many kind of the nature and ecosystem conservation actions. So. Anyway, my suggestion is that uh, we need to find uh, some kind of way in many government actions uh, to consider species uh, extinction or flagship species in their planning or in their actions. That is my second, uh, second suggestion. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Javier Cisternas from Chile asks uh, about the link between the local human context, human behavior, social system, and the relationship to the application of GSAPs. Are there any thoughts about that that you would like to share? Um, I can take that, John Paul. I think that, you know, it's one of the reasons why I said that we mustn't only plan for threatened species and restricted range species. We must really also highlight socioeconomically important species, species that are that people have used for cultural purposes, uh, species that are important for health, for food, for all sorts of other um, elements that are crucial for our, our well-being. So, so really, when you look at what species you should be giving attention to, you have to include those, and you have to also work with indigenous peoples, local communities, um, to know what needs to happen with those species and to like co-develop solutions under target four when you're doing recovery work. We've got a whole program of work, for example, on recovering medicinal plant species that are, are almost gone and, and, and traditional healers can't use them anymore. But um, we're working with the, with with people to actually identify what are the actions that are needed, um, you know, growing those species, bringing them back. And so it's, it's very rewarding to do it like that. So I think that's how we can also make it relevant. We can make species conservation relevant. So we can't only focus on things that are threatened, but we have to focus on things that are threatened, socioeconomically important, and all. <laughs> yeah. 
I see Peter Goodman's question is similar, I guess, generally because it fo it focuses on on rhino horn as a as a case where the finding a viable alternative to the legal trade hasn't succeeded. But that's a I guess the spirit would be the same. Would be that you focus on species that have uh, alternative values that you could develop as a con as a way in these plants. We could probably go for a long time with rhino, so I'm going to just keep it at this kind of high level answer for now, Peter. Thank you for your for your question. Uh, Cristina Lopez Gallego, she uh, asks about um, uh, fungi and uh, and uh, plants of less charismatic groups um, that might need a little bit more attention. And she asks you specifically, Domitila, if you could mention what are the voluntary complement actions for plants? No, wait, I'm not understanding. Complementary actions for what? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe you can take a read to that. Oh, okay. So, so yeah. So, so in terms of what people are doing, in terms of voluntary, voluntary actions, I don't know if Christina wants to talk to it. If she can. Perhaps she's talking through that that we can actually bring people to do volunteer work, which which is actually going quite far. So you can get um, volunteer contributions to actually monitoring the status of species, knowing what's going on in the in, in the wild through citizen science work. That's incredibly important. Some amazing examples on iNaturalist and different mega diverse countries using iNaturalist. And then voluntary actions and recovery work too. So voluntary actions to to cultivate species, to to breed them if they're animals and to to do reintroductions and adoptions of habitats. So yeah, I think those are possible. I don't know if Christina wants to explain a little bit more what she's asking. Yeah, we're just running out of time, but I just wanted to mention that uh, I mentioned a few seconds ago, Amanda Vincent, the Marine Conservation uh, Committee co uh, Chair, and she just she's online as well, answering to Karim, Karim also. So great to have this connection. Please uh, find her um, email address on the chat and the questions and answers. We're running out of time. A couple of, I'll, I'll do a couple of quick ones uh, in respect to the G7 representative in Nigeria. I suggest that you reach out to the to the Nigeria Species Specialist Group that we're in the process of creating. There's a, a center for species survival in Nigeria as well, which is a structure of SSC. And that will be a good place to start. Uh, you can also reach out to Dao, obviously, and she can put you in touch with any relevant person also. So that takes care of that one. Quentin Luke, uh, what is the UCN doing to increase funding, personnel and support for the Red List units so they can publish assessment in a timely manner? Well, the, I can say to that, Quentin, that we are in April 4th, we're meeting in London with the new Red List partners. The partnership was signed uh, last year in the middle of the year, and it's now in, in full force. This will be the first meeting with the Director General of IUCN, with Gretel Aguilar, and all the CEOs of the partner organizations. And we aim to focus specifically on that question of uh, fundraising and supporting, not only supporting the species, the, the this unit in Cambridge, but also finding other ways to support the network more generally, to distribute decentralized support. We're trying to be a bit creative, but it's definitely at the top of our priorities to strengthen the capacity of IUCN to publish assessments in a timely manner. Um, I'm going to go to one that we haven't heard. Karin Schwarz, reverse the as a movement to integrate action between governments, ex to facilities, NGOs, and multilateral agreements. How can SSC facilitate increased involvement from the ex to community and SSC specialist group working towards the goals of GSAP? Yes, we I mean, uh, you, you may have seen that last year we published in October, I think it was, a statement, an SSC position statement on the role of zoos, aquariums, and botanic gardens and conservation. We're very, very interested in closing and, and becoming more, more connected with the community. We already are quite connected with the community and uh, we see a, a major role that zoos, aquariums, and botanic gardens can play and have played historically. Uh, on species conservation, recovery, and many, many other dimensions. So uh, absolutely, the ex to component is a, a major aspect of GSAP and all the activity, species conservation activity that we do. Uh, well, we're, we're running, we ran out of time. 
there are a couple of, of additional questions on the chat. We'll make sure that the people these questions are addressed to get them and they're able to respond to you by email later on. It's really fantastic to, to see so many of you to stay throughout the webinar and, and provide so much feedback and interesting comments. We, we see GSAP really growing and spreading and becoming a major tool uh, to develop the National Biodiversity Action Plans and many other uh, efforts at the, at the national level. Uh, please remain in touch. You can reach out to the Secretariat. Any of us here on the presentation are also available uh, to connect you and to help you in any way we can. And, and uh, uh, you know, UCN through its members and its offices and SSC more specifically through our networks of experts are here to help and to support you. So thank you everyone for being here. Really fantastic to see you. And uh, thanks to, to all of our speakers for uh, somebody mentioned in the chat for your succinct and to the point um, presentations, which was really excellent. And thanks to the SSC team who's been sitting behind the scenes, Aritzais, Milanjan and Naomi, uh, for keeping this uh, so smooth and, and uh, well organized. Thank you, David, Ilion, Domitila, and Dao for your excellent presentations. And to all of you who participated for your feedback and your interest. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Shampo and everyone. Thank you.